Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 40K Fireside Podcast. I'm David Gaylor, and I'm joined by my good friend, Vic Vijay. Together, we discuss 40K in the meta from our perspective, along with events we've recently been to and those that have got coming up. So come on down to the fireside and listen. Alright everyone, welcome back to the 40k Fireside Podcast. I'm really excited to do this one. It's episode 18. We're going to be covering the results of the Manchester Super Major. And as you may have inferred from the title, we've got our third guest. <laughs> I got it right. Third guest for the 40k Fireside Podcast, our beloved friend Brian Sight, who is our new teammate on Team Ignite. If you guys haven't met Brian, he uh, won the Leicester Super Major two years ago with Orcs and then placed a second to Vic at uh, the previous list of Super Major with Orcs. He is a big Orc boy himself, but uh, he's played a range of things from Tau, uh, maybe going into Eldar, Orcs like I discussed, and he's been playing Iron Hands with us recently at the team tournament last year, our last event, and also at Manchester recently. So we're going to have um, a couple of different lists, and I'll be the one asking the questions, and I'll be letting these guys do all the talking. <laughs> um, but before we do that, a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, I'm going to use this po- a podcast for my own personal financial gain. Uh, I have a, um, I have a uh, international team tournament <laughs> ticket to sell. If you do require one for the team tournament coming up, it's like 80 teams or something. That's like 400 players. Just uh, get in touch with us somehow. I'll give you a nice discount for it. And that money will basically go to funding the hosting costs for this podcast. So <laughs> there you go. You'll be directly supporting my wallet in the podcast. <laughs> that's in that, that's it. <laughs> um, but before that as well, uh, we, we don't ask this very much, but uh, it's something that I've um, just been uh, reminded to get a little bit better at. But if you do enjoy the content, um, give us a like, uh, you know, just give us a comment, just be like, Hey, you know, really like the content or give us a review on one of the podcasts that you listen to it from helps that, uh, giant internet algorithm of things to have us in better recommended feeds or something like that. So we can reach more people, but enough of that, enough of that, enough of the advertisement. Let's get on to the mean bones. That's what we're all here for. So without further ado, thank you very much, Brian Sight, for uh, joining the episode. Thanks guys. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Yes, Brian. Awesome. And actually, interestingly, Brian is also one of the uh, founding members of the new team that we've joined, uh, Team Ignite. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a joy to have you on here, Brian. And I think uh, we'll probably have you on a few more times if you keep up the good work you're <laughs> oh, doing I'll at tournaments. To, nice incentive. <laughs> We also we always need a third wheel in this, don't we, Vic? So, <laughs> rope Brian. <in. laughs> mm. Sorry, I was just sipping the uh, sipping the old whiskey there. So, like we uh, like we talked about the Manchester Super Major. So this was roughly two hundred and fifty something players, right, Vic? Two hundred fifty six, pretty, pretty much six. exactly nice there. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. obviously quite an aggressive cut for the top four. So just to context. Scoring a lot of points is very important in an event like this. I think there must have been about seven or eight undefeated in a 256 player. So, um, you know, having a list that can do that, important for the event. But there was, of course, as you probably already know, uh, a rather um, extreme (laughs) meta uh, unit released prior to this event, the Desolation Marines, which were very much the hot topic for the entire weekend. And I think if one thing goes to show... Uh, the UK meta is extremely fast adapting uh, to new releases and uh, things like this. We have many, many, many extremely skilled players with a lot of resources uh, available to them that will take every opportunity to play the new thing, the new hot thing, if it's strong or if even it's remotely strong. That was the takeaway from me personally, is that a l- mm-hmm. the meta is so fast and aggressive here that if something could be good, there will be top players trying to break that unit uh, and play it. And that's exactly what we saw on the weekend. And uh, it turned out to be more than the correct choice because there were 48 <laughs> Desolation Marines total in all four lists, um, as in 12 on average per each. Uh, but some people were playing upwards of 25, I believe, and some people were playing as low as 8. So definitely the hot topic. Is that what it felt like at uh, Manchester, Vic? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, there's a, there's a story to this, definitely, because um, Manchester was struggling because a lot of people couldn't get tickets because it was so incredibly popular. So, actually, I just assumed it was going to be the most chilled out event. No one's going to be there. And by the time it actually got to the event, a lot of the very best players had registered for the event. So I knew there were going to be uh, it was going to be a difficult run no matter what. What I hadn't accounted for was that, A, the Desolation Marines had definitely made the cut. And they had only just made the cut. 
So I assumed, okay, not everyone is going to jump onto this. The only inkling I had that potentially they're a good unit is from Brian. Because Brian was in our chat and he was telling us, look, you know what? These Desolation Marines are good. I just assumed Brian hates my elves and wanted to kill them. But in reality, they were very, very good in the meta. Um, and what happened was when the lists were released, if we take, say, the top 15 players at the event, I'd say maybe 12 of them had Marines. And of them, 90% of them were running the Desolation mm -hmm. Marines. Some of them more than even two units. So some were running three units. So that's a pretty... Uh, like dramatic shift towards this unit and um you know if you guys haven't seen the desolation marine profile i'm actually going to pass this one over to brian to give a bit of context of this unit and what actually makes it really strong <laughs> yeah that's really good i think the core lesson here is that the uk just paints faster than the rest of the world um, <laughs> so marines in a week um but uh this this unit on the surface i think a lot of people when they saw the profile they weren't that impressed um but mm -hmm. when you actually begin to consider it and put it within the context of what Marines are good and bad at and what they struggle with in given matchups, uh, Desolation Marines are incredible. So uh, these are 35-point Marines, which is quite expensive, um, especially given the point cuts recently. However, um, they come with uh, a super frag launcher, which is one of my favorite things to say, um, <laughs> which is like a d6 plus three or something like that um shot um strength four is kind of like the it's akin to the uh frag missiles that a like a missile launcher or a cyclone missile launcher might shoot um except it's uh you know more reliable in the number of shots uh strength four ap1 but those can be switched for the um super crack launcher super which crack. is um <laughs> which is effectively uh a dark lance um except 12 inches longer so it's 48 inch range um it's strength eight it's AP3, D3 plus 3 damage, but because you can stay in the Devastator Doctrine, it's AP4. Um, and that's every single one of these Marines, Sergeant included, can be equipped with this super crack launcher, which I did take the opportunity to say as often as possible. <laughs> um, super crack. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, uh, because that would be that would be not worth 35 points, I don't think, because you have some really great anti-tank with eradicators and such in the unit. Um, you have... Uh, just strapped to the bottom of this is a second weapon, uh, which is important. Not a combi weapon, not a pick one the fire weapon, but a second gun that you got to shoot, which fire is a strength four, AP one, one damage, D3 shot, blast, indirect gun. And that last bit is key. Mm -hmm. um, Marines have always struggled sometimes digging things out of ruins. Um, that's why you see a lot of Vanguard vets and Space Marine squads and you know a couple of um, other close combat units because hitting something behind a wall can be really tough for Marines because they're they're great at um, exposing weak terrain while they jump behind a wall or something like that or jump, jump, jump from an angle, but not like Tau or Eldar where they can move very quickly from a safe position to an angle. Um, they really have to stage and kind of march towards it over the course of the game. So mm -hmm. eliminating that need by giving them effectively 5 D3 um, strength 4 AP 1 and their heavy weapons are their AP 2 shots um is incredibly potent um, wait they're heavy weapons no. so they also give you codex warfare right <laughs> oh they sure do yeah um, and and they work in that doctrine that you stay in the whole game right yeah you stay in the death oh, the entire okay. game so you get <laughs> wow. an ap um the ah. f the first time i activated the squad um was against an 11 well i'll get this a little bit later but i was against a guard army and uh each squad picked up four Codex Warfare points um, <laughs> on the first turn. So. Oh, so nice. there must be some drawback to them, right? Like, they must really suffer when you move them or, you know, the range is really bad. So they, they, surely they can't be that reliable to shoot, right? <laughs> uh, yes, as you can see, Dave um, is foreshadowing there. Um, they don't really have weaknesses. Um, they are 36-inch range for the indirect gun, 48 for the big one. Uh, the biggest weakness that you could say they have is they're, they're still quite expensive, but for mm. the role they fill and the output they have... Um, there's a reason why we saw some armies with 25, 20 of them. Um, mm -hmm. They're extremely good. Um, and that's not the only part where their, their rules um, stop. Uh, <laughs> so the sergeant has an Omni Specs, um, which is similar to the one you see on a Devastator squad, where he can pick a model in the unit to have ballistic skill 2+. Uh, oh, it's, great. It's important, right? Because when you're firing an indirect weapon, your ballistic skill goes down by 1. So that means that because he changes the ballistic skill and it's not plus 1 to hit, he changes to a 2-up, then he fires indirect, it goes to a 3-up. 
Ah, damn Games Workshop. They thought about that indirect nerf that they did and thought, how can we avoid that? And in addition to that, the sergeant has a flat two damage uh, indirect gun, um, which you can pay one CP for to make flat three damage with the master crafted. It's high Twitter, strength. I... It's high. Uh, it's it's strength six, AP two, D six shots mm. as a two damage, or as Dave said, three damage. He has another upgrade when you take that weapon, which allows him to get plus one to hit, which means that that sergeant shoots mm-hmm. D six shots, <laughs> and his D three gun underneath, um, that hit on twos, and in an army like Iron Hands. You're rerolling ones. <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's the thing. You know, as you just explained it just then, what really got me is that they have the two guns. I feel like if they merged them into a combi weapon, that would go a long way. Now, we're not going to go into fixing them, but I feel like that would go a long way to toning them down a bit. But it's the fact that they actually have two separate guns that they can shoot. So there's one turn where maybe you can move out, you know, indirect someone with no heavy penalty and indirect line of sight and then shoot Dark Lines. This is like, man, I mean, what do these guys not do? Are you sure they don't have, like, a lightning claw reach or something as well, Play. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're still space marines, so they get shock attack, and they're in intercessors, so they've got three attacks when you charge them. Yeah, um, fantastic. So that's reasonable. Uh, I mean, I think we need to look at some context um, with regards to indirect fire here, because in terms of the history of indirect fire, this is still relatively weak indirect fire, but the potency of indirect fire within competitive 40k has continuously come up because the ability to pick up units, to uh, essentially to play a passive game with continuous continuous attrition across the game means the value of indirect fire units is not just their single turn output, but their output across an entire game. And that can lead to these kinds of list design where people take as much indirect fire as possible when it's even slightly good in order to kind of make lists which are quite oppressive in the meta. And that's what okay, we're I'm seeing call you here. Up for a second. You said in the mm. history, it's maybe not as oppressive as some indirect has been. I think Hive Guard mm-hmm. are probably the pinnacle of indirect, right? Because they were also existent in a period where indirect didn't suffer the um, penalty, right? Uh, so yeah, that's right. On the scale of Hive Guard, I think these guys are actually better, and it's representative of the fact that in in tournaments at the time, which I was playing, um, I was probably the Crusher Stampede player at LVO playing them. I only played six Hive Guard. Now that's one unit of six, three hundred points. In the event we saw in Manchester. Playing 25 Desolation Marines is upwards of 900 points, well, it's about 800 or 700 points of indirect. That's twice as much. So I would beg to differ that actually I think these guys are better than Hive Guard were in the, in the meta. No, uh, so, so my side of the argument for that is that indirect fire is more manageable the lower the AP and the strength is in the unit, regardless of volume. You're able to manage it with your list design. The reason why Hive Guard was so oppressive, so the six is double firing, so it's like having 12 Hive Guard, is that it's high strength, high AP, ignore yeah. cover. Those, whereas now we have an indirect fire nerf where you get an additional point of AP and you get a cover save against these Desolation Marines outside okay. Imperial Fists, which is not one of the three sub-factions it's being used in. So there are tech choices that can be made. Now, Manchester was very interesting because nobody knew how good Desolation Marines were necessarily because we haven't seen it on the board or in any tournament results. And they were very widely represented uh, in the tournament. So much so there was a shock to the system and no one had prepared to Mm -hmm. play against them. And I think that kind of tilts the results a little bit as well because we haven't made the list design choices required to protect against low AP, high volume, indirect Mm -hmm. fire like this. Um, so yeah, that's my kind of take on it. I think there has been more oppressive indirect fire in the past, but this is very oppressive if you haven't prepared for it. And that's kind of how, especially I went into this event now, because I really didn't I mean, guess this. It was this. difficult to prepare for as well. So, but I agree with your assessment on the Hive Guard thing. I think when you take into account the strength and the AP, and they ignore cover, and they didn't have the, the cover, they were effective AP four. Yeah. yeah, ignoring the cover is big because mm-hmm. it's so hard for Marines to get access to. Yeah. Um, Although, Although we did have armor of not contempt. in Death Watch, which might be something to come up soon. <laughs> so why don't we uh, crack through the list really quick? We've got a lot, lot to cover this time. Uh, Brian, you were playing the, uh, I don't want to call it the flavor of the month, but it's definitely one of the kind of top three armies up there, right? You were playing Iron Hands. Why don't you run us through exactly top to bottom real quick what you actually bring? Yeah, so um, I am playing Iron Hands uh, successor. Um chapter so i have war one rage and master artisans um and if you're you know a fan of stat check then you'll see that they're doing very well um <laughs> right now better than the rest of the marines um mm-hmm. and so 
Iron Hands traditionally, at least when they're kind of that the good list is built around MSU units um, that uh, help support um, the Contemptor Dreadnought, who is incredibly strong and just kind of uh, scores really well. So, and the Miami list is kind of built around those principles. So I've got a Primaris Tech Marine, uh, who has the Warlord Trade Target Protocols, giving a reroll to a hit, wound, and damage to a unit within six in the shooting phase. Um, I have a Primaris Lieutenant, uh, who has uh, Rights of War, and then a Vox of Spiritum to give him an extra three inch range to his auras, so it's nine inches. Uh, and he, that guy definitely got his cardio in over the weekend. He was advancing quite a bit to kind of throw his auras around. Um, two units of infiltrators with helix gauntlets. A 10 man unit of vanguard veterans, which always combat squatted, uh, with jump packs, a sergeant, um, everyone's got a lightning claw, sergeant has a relic blade. I had three storm shields and the rest of them had, had chain swords just to kind of get some optimization. Um, I didn't own grav pistols or those chain swords would have been grav pistols. Um, mm -hmm. and then I had two units of, uh, scouts with camo cloaks, sniper rifles, and a missile launcher with the sergeant has a thunder hammer because it's free for some reason that eludes me. <laughs> um, I have a relic contemptor dreadnought, um, who I'm sure people have played against and hated. Uh, he's a character. Um, he has merciless logic. So six is to hit explode, but it's the old way. So you have to roll to hit. Um, he has two Volkite culverins and a, uh, cyclone missile launcher. I have two land speeder tornadoes. Um, I have two land speeder storms. I have a drop pod, and inside that drop pod, I put two five man units of devastators. Uh, each squad um, has a sergeant armed with a combi melt and thunder hammer. Uh, again, don't know why that's free, but it is. Um, <laughs> they have more Mahurium cherubs for the extra shot. Um, and then one squad is one multi melta, three grav cannons. The other one is two multi melta, two grav cannons. Nice. Um, I think I mentioned the eradicators, and then uh, the, you know, Bell of the Ball right now, two units of five Desolation Marines with Fangor launchers and target optics on the sergeants. Nice. This is so what did you, list. what I, I was going to ask is, what did you change to take, to bring in the Desolation Marines? So obviously two units of five is, they're 190 points a piece, are they? Or they're 100? Uh, they're 185 with the Vanguard launcher. So 185 points a piece, 370 points total. What did you cut from your old list to fit them in essentially? So uh, before, I had a second unit of Eradicators um, and a Gladiator Reaper, um, and that was about 285. Um, and then I think I dropped a Speeder as well. Okay. Um, there might have been some other tweaking on Storm Shield and stuff. One of the problems with writing Marine lists actually is that because all the War Gear is free, sometimes it's actually kind of hard to tweak things. Yeah. Um, because you want to take 10-man squads or 6-man squads because you want to have the ability to combat squads. You can't just drop a guy here or else the squad actually operates very differently. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, f just off the like, first impressions, you drop a Gladiator Reaper, you drop Eradicators, but you already have some Eradicators as well, so you've got that role sort of filled, uh, and you've got the Devastator Pod, which is kind of similar to Eradicators, and you gain 10 units, uh, 10 models of indirect and direct fire. Like It seems like if... Iron Hands were like an eight. It this is really pushing them up to like a nine, nine point something, right? It yeah, it it really helped a lot. Um, we struggled. Well, well, we had I think a an okay matchup into guard, but it was a, mm. it was a very much a game. Yeah. Um, adding these um, Eradicator or Desolation Marine, excuse me, was uh, a game changer. Um, we also sometimes mm. we having the second unit of Eradicators. In some matchups, Eradicators are amazing. In some matchups, they're actual just trash. Yeah. Um, for example, against GSC, I'll use them to screen and just sacrifice because they're they're that bad. Um, but now I get to replace them with units that have anti-tank and the ability to shoot models out of line of sight. So against GSC, that's really important because if they have a 20-man squad, one thing that Gene Sterling call players absolutely love to do is put their, their heavy weapons just outside of a building, the rest of the squad inside, and then when you shoot it, you kill 10 12 mm -hmm. other guys and they have eight guys left but nothing can see them and then they regenerate them returning those guns you just killed and they're just as effective at their output yeah. but now i don't have to kill them in a single activation because you have the indirect guns to finish off the remnants and that yeah. dramatically changes that matchup that's and i think that's why indirect is so powerful like obviously indirect is powerful because it gives you the passivity of having pressure on your opponent whilst not committing but 
the real powerhouse to it is that uh, redundancy it adds into any target. So if you have maybe underkilled a unit that you were expecting on average to kill, you know, the indirect fire gives you that fail safe of picking up that unit as well. So it really like it covers so many bases and that's what I think the Desolation Marines, why they're actually so powerful is it covers, it rounds off some of these armies that will had some levels of one dimensionality to them. Dark Angels being that, right? They've either got Terminators or Ravenwing. And it really just cover, you know, obviously I said it before, covers a lot of bases, which makes them even more difficult to um, to beat. Because what clear weakness do they have, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's definitely true. And and you know, Marines, as as we kind of said in the beginning, we're always struggling with that how to dig things out of ruins um, mm. without going out there and pulling you out of the ruin. Uh, the only indirect uh, that I'm aware of is there's a couple. There's whirlwinds, which are not that great and then the thunderfire cannon which has historically been either fantastic or terrible <laughs> and is currently in the terrible stage right now so having something that's actually quite good is uh is really dangerous for marines yeah. so that's i think probably your list do you think you would change anything after the event like anything significant um, pretty happy with you, bro. i i really like my list i think it's very good the only thing i would like to try and find room for if i could is uh, a banner and an apothecary yeah. um I think both those guys are extremely strong. Um, and the apothecary to potentially resurrect the um, Desolation Marines if you get Desolation Marine to yourself, right? Exactly, yeah. Right. I think it's uh, I think it's very strong. Apothecary is less important because you have the access to the Fiona Bane strat. Yeah. But the res is nice. But the, the shoot on death, um, mm-hmm. as I saw in the Dark Angels matchups that had them, was incredibly powerful. Um, yeah. And just being able to, to shoot your Vanguard launcher on your sergeant, then they shoot back at you with indirect, you kill the sergeant, um, shoot on death with that sergeant, then you use an apothecary to bring the sergeant back, shoot him mm. again, is like... It's, it's pretty good, so. <laughs> yeah, brutal. Okay. Yeah, you get so many activations with that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's go on with Vic. Uh, obviously, you brought Eldar Vic, and I think um, you know there was some discussion in the team chat around like what you were going for. You know, We potentially played some games beforehand, and the levels of indirect that you perhaps were going to bring, and I think the underlying discussion or context to what brian just said is that there is as i kind of said a kind of cold or cold war arm race to maybe it's not cold wars because people are playing but uh, there's an arms race to indirect which is do you bring mm-hmm. more indirect than your opponent or do you go no indirect at all and you play things that indirect are bad into you know how, what kind of level are we at is it just gonna are people just gonna play 30 desolation marines are people gonna play zero so you know there's a there's some thinking into that right so you know how did it affect what you think you're gonna bring I mean, I think this kind of indirect where it's not that potent, you know, it's it's good, really, really good, but not extremely devastating, like it can't kill everything. You do have the option of building defensive profiles that can survive it. That's one option. You have an option of killing it um, and you have to build certain tech pieces. That's when the indirect kind of escalation increases. And then it becomes the person who goes first, gets the first upper hand on the indirect war. And then uh, the last one is an alpha strike. So you actually kind of put so much forward pressure and threat saturation that you win just by going first. Those are kind of the three routes you can go down when indirect fire is too oppressive. All of those completely narrow the meta down. So there's a very small number of things that can work at the top of the meta when indirect fire is really good. Um, Now, Eldar is a faction. Um, exist around the fringes of being acceptable in this kind of meta. I think people potentially underestimated how good Eldar are. Um, Going into this, as soon as everyone saw how many Desolation Marines were in there, they just kind of like messaged me like, oh, how do you feel about the Desolation Marines? Oh, you know, your elves are going to be dead, all this stuff. And while I think that is true to an extent, I think it is not completely hopeless uh, well, and, and you kind of encouraged me about this before the event because I was a bit down and I was like, why am I even bothering going to this? And you were like, hold on a second, Vic. Look at these elements in your list and tell me how this game actually yeah. flows out. You have to look at the positive sides of your list as well as the things yeah. that are problems. That's kind of, I was just I saying, was qu- as a side mm. note, I always take that stance to everything. I'm always like, even if something is bad, I try and turn it into a positive. So I look at actually, okay, these people bring a lot of Desolation Marines, but what are the weaknesses of this unit? Okay, the army is very slow, right? You know, Manny Chima's list, attack bikes instead of uh, Desolation Marines instead of attack bikes. Well, actually, your list is really slow at that point, so maybe you can play the angle, uh, play the ranges, and it's a lot more predictable and linear. So that was, I think, the only weakness to them, potentially. But carry on. For sure. So my list is designed to try and beat 
God and dark angels. Um, so I, for, on the God side, I wanted to survive indirect fire from the mortars. And then on the dark angel side, I wanted to be able to manage dark angels terminators. Um, so here's my list. I'm going to run through it now. So um, it's a it's an Eldari list. So it's a soup of Harlequins and Eldar. The main detachment, my Arcs of Omen detachment, is a craft world detachment with a custom craft world, which is ignore cover and reroll a single wound roll. I've got a Farseer, Skyrunner, and Baharoth as my um, HQ choices. The Farseer has the little mortal wound pistol and the Warlord trait for extra mortal wounds when he shoots as well. And then we had five Rangers, six Dire Avengers, five Striking Scorpions with the usual upgrades on the Exarch, a Warlock Skyrunner um, with Protect and Jinx, two units of Shroud Runners, a Viper. And then we had a, an indirect fire heavy support detachment with uh, a, a element which is a night spinner with a crystal targeting matrix to ignore modifiers, a rate seer with a D cannon and quicken and restrain, and then three single D cannon platforms. So all those uh, units take advantage of the reroll wound trait. And then we had a traveling patrol of Harlequins, which was light Sadith, uh, with a shadow seer with mirror of minds and fog of dreams. We had two units of five troops. One of them had two weapons in them, and the other one was just naked. Uh, we had a Death Jester with Favor of Segrak, Harvester of Torment, the usual combo, and a Solitaire, um, as well as two Star Weavers. Now, there are so many tech elements in that list. <laughs> so many. Um, I don't know where you want me to start, um, Dave. I think the standout point is that you you do bring some mm -hmm. of your own indirect fire, right? So when, when I was talking before about that arms race of indirect... You do have your own things that can target Desolation Marines themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, the Night Spinner is quite a good tool in this meta in general. Uh, so the Night Spinner is uh, 2d6 strength 7 minus 2-2 two, two damage uh, and ignores cover in this sub-faction. So essentially you're working on minus 1 to their save. Quite good into Marine bodies and also into Mortars. The actual efficiency is pretty poor, but they do on average kill two Desolation Marines. That on its own isn't actually enough attrition for the Dark Angels game because of the resurrecting a model. And in fact, it, it actually increases the damage output of the Desolation Marines because they just shoot the Vengo launcher on death and bring it back alive. <laughs> Um, so uh, actually the Desolation Marines are not the correct target if you only have a single Night Spinner. You need two Night Spinners for you to actually compete in that indirect war using a Night Spinner, which is a bit awkward. It's kind of sad, isn't um, it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so then you've got obviously uh, three support platforms as well, but these are not really designed to um, you know, target Desolation Marines, right? They only have 24-inch range. No. They're not. They're, they're part of the solution for the Deathwing Terminators. With a reroll a wound, you can get around the transhuman, uh, can only be wounded on fours. So there's enough output between them and the, the mortal wounds in the list uh, to actually get through, um, you know, uh, more than five uh, yeah. uh, Terminators. Uh, on average, about eight to nine, if everything so goes the last, through. So this will be the last time I try and touch on these guys. So your plan into Desolation Marines is to do what exactly? Uh, my plan into Desolation Marines is not to leave any good targets on the board. So the D cannons go straight into strat reserves and they come out and uh, activate at least once because they're probably the single best target in my list for Desolation Marines to shoot at. Uh, I got quite lucky because the Wraith Seer as a choice instead of like, say, two foot warlocks. Or I know a lot of people run three warlock Skyrunners, which can be targeted. Those are very bad units in this meta because they can be targeted by the Desolation Marines and you end up losing your Quicken and Restrain, which removes your psychic secondary which is very useful in the marine matchup um, so the fact that i have my quicken and restrain on a rate seer who is very very tough t8 minus one damage uh, and is a vehicle as well so can character protect other characters um, is really really strong um, yeah rate seer is not a character so he can protect other characters um, so yeah that's really my tech the light sadith as well they can only be hit on fours outside of uh, 18 inches which is very powerful against the the kind of very accurate indirect fire from the yeah, marines i think so... harlequins are naturally quite good against uh, the the distillation meta at the moment right uh, i think if, actually if you just played mm -hmm. pure harlequins into this event you probably if you made the top four would probably having a good time uh there right 
Uh, you need to have uh, you need to deal with both sides of the the yeah. marine problem, uh, especially if it's dark angels. You need to deal with the terminators as well as the indirect fire, as well as surviving the land speeders. So there's almost three three different angles you need to cover your list from. My list was quite well designed for the land speeder side of things and the terminator side of things. Uh, I kill the land kill the terminators, uh, or I slow them down and control them with all my movement so modifiers. Perhaps let's talk uh, about your yeah. spoiler alert uh, game five against mm -hmm. Alex Pitford. Uh, now, Alex was mm -hmm. running 20 Terminators, I want to say off the top of my head, and uh, a smattering of, I believe, 20, 15 Desolation Marines. Maybe it was 20. Oh, yeah, 10, 10, 10 Desolation Marines. Um, so he toned down the Desolation Marines compared yeah. to Manny a little bit. Um, but it's probably the worst list that I could have hit on round five. Um, so that's do you want to start what, here, Dave? Well, is I was the... thinking because your list is so much so jump straight in. in. I wanted to just touch on touch on that uh, match because I feel like that'll be a good example of where your tick pieces come in, right? Is it, I so, think covering is everything. The strongest Dark Angel list that was at the event. I think it was very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's an it's a nightmare for me because um, going into this so this matchup is already bad for me with the Desolation Marines included, and Alex's list was more balanced, so he had lots of stuff on the board. The extra points he saved from not going all fully deep in on the Desolation Marines, he gained uh, lots of land speeders which he could play. He also designed his list to start with at least two command points, so he had this unit of three land speeders that he could. Um, so he started with three CP. So this is two CP to pre-game move these three land speeders, shoot something, charge something, and then two CP, which he would be, he would be gaining a CP on round one to then <laughs> jump away to safety. So this is kind of a free alpha strike for him. This is the worst thing that an Eldar player could have to deal with um, because they move 30, 38 inches yeah. and then shoot. No, they, more than that, 38 plus D6 because they can advance and shoot with no penalty. Oh, but then they can't charge. So 38 inches. That goes 14 inches deep into my deployment. So, uh, <laughs> Dave, what do I do? I just hope that they can't maybe charge something or... <laughs> I mean, that's, that's tough. So, um, obviously, you ended up winning this game. So, kind of tick pieces... Mm -hmm. What are your tick pieces in your list that deal with the Terminators, for example? Because obviously they're a huge problem. They're still the most mm -hmm. present unit in the army, I think, on the board itself. So, you kind know, of, what? How are we tackling this? So, so uh, maybe I should just go through this whole game because, yeah. um, like, it kind of flows quite accurately, and. Um, it's a really, really interesting game because I'm definitely on the back foot, but I'm not out of this game from the start. The macro strategy of this game, and this is a side of the game which usually comes to me really well, is that I need to design a situation where his resources are coming at me piecemeal. And the very first step of that is taking Assassinate in this matchup. Um, Alex was running two little Acolytes, um, which are kind of one of the Imperial Agents things, uh, to kind of do actions. But they're, they're both characters. So at this point, I know Alex is going to have his Ravenwing Apothecary, a Banner Guy, a uh, Talon Master, two of these little guys, and a Captain. And he's going to be quite defensive with them because he can narrow me out of a secondary. So that means that they're likely to not be coming too far forward and it's very likely to leave Terminators unsupported. If he does try to bring them forward, I have a lot of things which can target characters. My list is very des well designed to pick up Dark Angels characters. Uh, so that situation immediately helps reduce threat saturation. And then uh, the other secondaries were all very normal in this game. And then the way that the game flowed was that Alex set up his Terminators quite far forward, as you would expect, and one unit of Desolation Marines tucked in forward as well in a forward ruin. And then he had one right at the back. So this forward Desolation Marine unit was fully covered by the banner, but the aim was that it could kind of shoot on death, the 36 inches could reach all the way into my deployment zone. But that immediately gives me an opportunity if I go first to kind of be quite aggressive and try and kill them. So I have a few game plans kind of in place if I go first, but I ended up going second. Alex got his alpha strike and Alex went in. I had phantasmed really defensively and tucked it in so that there were two goals achieved. One was if Alex was going to shoot, he was only going to shoot the units I want him to shoot, which was a Star Weaver on one side or a Viper on another side of the board. And the second thing was if he tried to go in and uh, attack me, I would have a solitaire in a position that the solitaire would be able to reach wherever he falls back to. 
Um, so I pre-measured all of this, so I knew I was going to be okay with that. And he did. He went in, he killed a Star Weaver, charged the Viper, didn't kill the Viper, but then ran away. And he was in range of the Solitaire to attack him. I'd also put Baharoth next to the Solitaire, so I was getting a little bit of melee into the land speeders. Um, and at this point, the game plan is becoming about attrition and controlling areas of the board. So I ignored his Terminators completely. I just moved to the side, tried to pick up that unit of three land speeders and another land speeder on the side and create an area of the board which he couldn't attack with anything. Um, and once you get that situation with Eldar, it starts to really roll in your favor across an entire game when you're able to hold eight primary. And I was able to hold eight primary all the way through this game. Um, as we move further into the game, Alex uh, had started to lose a few Desolation Marines because I'd kind of thrown my Death Jester there, picked up a Desolation Marine unit. My Night Spinner had been picking away at the other Desolation Marine units, so it was starting to get whittled down. His activations with his Desolation Marines were going into nothing good. Um, he maybe you know killed a few Rangers, maybe just like damaged Star Weavers a little bit. It takes all 10 Desolation Marines realistically to kill a Star Weaver. Um, so I'm winning the attrition war and then the terminators are very aggressively pushed forward. And this is the point where my list design really came forward. Um, what I did was the rates here cast restrain on one unit of 10 terminators. And then I had my shroud runners there within 12 inches of the terminators so I can reduce their uh, movement by D3 again in the, in the movement phase with the stratagem. Uh, so essentially this unit of 10 terminators was completely locked down in the middle of the board. Next bit was I had all of my mortal wound output able, in the middle of the board able to reposition to one of his units of Terminators. So the other unit of 10 got hit by um, all of my psychers with smites uh, and the mortal wound output, which sh I should expect to kill between 3 to 4. So it should do between 9 to 12 mortal yeah. wounds there. And in the shooting phase, all of my D cannons came out of strategic reserves with direct line of sight nice. to this Terminator Next unit as well. Exactly, because the mortal wound output would tend to keep them above six six models. So at least one of these D cannons is going to get blast max shots. Now I completely whiffed the psychic phase, so I then compensated by having blast on all three of the D cannons here. Um, and then after that, and then a charge with a Harlequin unit, um, which can do mortal wounds when they charge. You roll five D six, any four pluses is a mortal wound, and then any sixes to wound is another mortal wound. After the dust settled, he had two terminators left, and one of them was, I think, on one wound or something. Um, and then the other unit was just completely locked down. So uh, Alex was starting to run out of his fast-moving resources. He'd lost his one of his terminator units, and another one is just stuck in the middle of the board, and he's just got like three desolation marines left. At this point, the game's over. Like, um, I, uh, there's no way Alex can win from that board state. Um, me and Alex talk, talked a lot after the game, what he could have done differently in terms of positioning. He really had to hold on to the Desolation Marines more. He had to be much more conservative with his land speeders. Every single land speeder needs to be used for yeah. scoring points. Uh, and if any of them are picked up, that's like minus three points yeah. on... Um, on behind enemy lines that's him struggling with grinding them down for Combat example the terminators too right otherwise it's much more ideally than... yeah four units of five is uh, a little bit harder for me to deal with it's quite an interesting choice to keep all 10 there's pros and cons to both but against a list like mine splitting into the fives probably would have worked a little yeah, better for i can just imagine this list is like uh, some cowboy about to like rope in a rope in a cattle on the ranch you know where he's got, he's got the lasso like he's right and he slings it at the cow and it ropes up constrained living on the edge yeah, though it, it, just one mistake and it all falls apart <laughs> I, did, I did that's for sure i ain't wrestling no cattle though <laughs> um great yeah fantastic so i mean those movement um movement technical pieces are obviously very good against terminators uh, given that you can actually reduce their movement to zero yeah which is zero kind of crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> but um yeah fantastic yeah. um i'm just cautious brian our main guest do you want to run us through mm -hmm. should you just give us the rounds one to five straight off the bat brian and kind of what the uh how it was going because i think if i recall correctly you scored a ludicrous amounts of points uh even by my standards <laughs> yeah so, uh, uh, around uh, a, little, five. a little context on, on that too so uh i'm, I'm on team scotland as, as dave said and our the captain of team scotland is ennis wilson hmm. um and ennis was playing a very similar list of mine because we 
Um, we had originally started from the same list, branched off in different directions, and came back together um, with the comfort of Desolation Marines and kind of wrote almost the exact same list. I think he dropped the Vox of Spiritum and uh, traded some speeders for different ones and, and, and that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. largely the same list. So, and in my head, not only do I need to score high in order to uh, make the cut, but I have to score more points than Ennis. <laughs> it's just mandatory. Um, therefore, I'm not dropping any points. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my thought, right? So um, I, I start with my round one pairing, um, and I'm against uh, Imperial Guard. And uh, normally this might give me a pause, yeah. but with the new version of the list, I was I was excited. I was like, all right, good. This is, this is the test, right? <laughs> Let's see if I'm right about this. Line him um, up, shoot him down. <laughs> uh, turns out that his list was actually a very skewed uh, kind of like uh, Lehman Rush, uh, yeah. Rush list. Yep. So he had 11 Lehman Russes, two, two tank commanders, three tank commanders, yeah, oh, two tank two. commanders and nine, uh, nine Lehman Russes. Um, and then he had six mortars and some, uh, some other couple, okay. couple pieces, but no, no Kazrakin, for example. So I was like, okay, yeah. well, I'm not going to find out if it's good against Kazrakin yet, but <laughs> you know, spoilers that'll come soon. Um, <laughs> turn one, as I mentioned, you know, this is kind of my first, my first activations with Desolation Marines. Each one of them picked up a Lehman Russ and a mortar squad. <laughs> so <laughs> just to, just for uh, context, the Lehman Russ is about on average about 175 points, right? And yeah. a mortar squad is 55, so they picked up 230 points uh, just, in a, on a Desolation squad, right? Just easily with wounds to spare. <laughs> like I would have split fire more shots if there were more infantry. There just weren't. <laughs> brutal <laughs> and of course that's because they have actually have two guns right yeah. dark lance and then they have the direct as well and this is kind of where I, a theme i saw this i saw throughout the event which is i actually fired these guys direct far more than i expected to I expected mm. to kind of be behind the wall and then in the late game maybe i'd poke mm. out and take some value shots when they need to indirect anymore but nature of, of the way 40k is right now with missions and having to dive on people's objectives to deny primary I can usually get some very tight angles where I can shoot them and they can't really effectively clap me back. Yeah. Um, so I got to say the word super crack a lot. <laughs> so round one, you completely obliterate your guard opponent off the board with a lemon lemon rushes, right? Lovely guy, uh, but it was 100 to 17. 100 to, <laughs> 100 to 17. Oh <laughs> not, not super close for him. Uh, um, okay, round two. Uh, I played against Craft Worlds, um, and this was an interesting one because I knew that Ooh, I knew nice. that you know Vic. Um, last time I, every time I play him with Iron Hands, and where I play another one of our teammates, Liam, um, <laughs> they just, as I think Dave said before, uh, hold the donut just out of reach, right? Yes. So you never get to get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was I was a little nervous, and this was a, a build that was uh, plus movement um, and ignore cover, I think. Um... Um, no, Swift Strikes, Advance and Battle Focus. It was that one and it was plus movement. So he had plus one move and plus two, and plus, uh, wow. plus two if you fly. So he was particularly fast. In fact, he had the OPSEC bike, which gives you a 20-inch move. Um, and then he had the Warlord trade mm-hmm. for plus two move. And then he had this trade for plus two move. <laughs> it was just like, it was, the guy was like 38 inches or something. It was absurd. <laughs> <laughs> really cool, actually. Um, uh, but this one was the first time I really got to leverage the indirect. Yeah. Um, and uh, against elves out of transports who had no preparation for this at all, it was brutal. He never scored a primary point, um, with the exception of a cut. I think he got four data intercepts. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, Ouch. you know, I, it, it just it just wasn't particularly close. Unfortunately, it was a very bad matchup for him. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good example of how I think indirect can just turn off some armies, which I've made a previous complaint about about guard mortars how they can just turn off blank up some armies which is not healthy for the game right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. okay so i take it you got 100 points in that one right Brian? yep 100 to 44 <laughs> fantastic okay well you know 27 <laughs> more points than your previous <laughs> opponent and uh, at this point you know ennis is also on, on 200 points so i'm like okay gotta keep it up <laughs> you gotta keep the race going <laughs> round three the final round of day one uh What's final it round of day one i actually played against um uh rich who uh, is uh, works for his workshop? Um, you might have seen hey. him in the recent tenth edition reveal tra- um, video. Um, Please tell me you one hundred ten this guy. Please. Oh, you are oh, getting Brian. nerfed I, so I hard, like Brian. Danger out to get them nerfed, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so we're, you know, we're playing, and um, <laughs> he was asking some questions about, you know, what do you think of X or Y? Once he kind of got an idea that I was a higher level player, I think. <laughs> um, and 
<laughs> and I, I when I mentioned that obliter or that the Desolation Marines were completely broken, um, you know, his eyes went a little wide, and he was, I think, quite surprised. But I kind of like walked him through it <laughs> oh my God. and showed him. I showed him exactly why. Um, <laughs> but his list was actually really cool. Um, it was. It wasn't a list I was gonna. If I'm being honest, I was ever gonna lose to. But it was a list that was actually a lot of fun. So it's World Eaters. Um, he had a Brass Scorpion. He had Scarbrand, and he had Angron. Okay. That's um, a lot of big stuff. Yeah, it was a lot, and so mm. um, so you got to say super crack missiles a lot. That's I good. did get to say super crack a lot, and from behind a wall, which is always nice. Um, <laughs> so I uh, there was a there was a turn where he decided, okay, I can't just like sit here and pick up objectives forever. Um, I've got to kind of push, and so he jumps Angron over the wall um, from the the big building ruin in this corner, uh, and just jumps him forward. Uses the warp locus ability to bring in Scarbrand within six. Um, and I've got these guys just like straight in front of me. Um, and I kind of threat ranged a lot of this, so he wasn't able to do crazy charges, but he brought them all down and it was looking, I was like, okay, I got to his, his thought process was, you know, the only way I have a shot here is I just give him every single threat and I say, can you kill it? And mm -hmm. if you can't, I got a real chance to win here. Um, which I think is a perfectly reasonable approach to take. For sure. Um, and, and it was touch and go there for a minute because I began my shooting phase and uh angron uh couldn't fail for up uh <laughs> he was he was hitting them all it was it was gross yeah oh, so no. there was a point where i think i shot my eradicators who did no damage um my dev squads who did no damage too and i was like oh god this is how my tournament ends well um, you know it's, it's <laughs> kind of about those trusty desolation marines right you haven't shot them yet <laughs> yeah so my desolation marines managed to take um take down angron i think in the end nice um and uh, and then I'd also managed to do about ten damage to Scarbrand between like I think a combat the turn before and, and yeah. a couple other shots. But the only thing I have left in my army to shoot is the um, is the Contemptor. And <laughs> Scarbrand, for context, is in front of my entire army. So <laughs> I am really nervous here. So I trigger the old classic Mercy's weakness yeah. for exploding wounds, which is another one of my favorite phrases to say. Iron Hands have a lot of those, um, and uh, just start blasting. Um, and I managed to get quite lucky, um, and I did, I think, only two mortal wounds, but I think I did, like, 16 actual wounds or something, was like, <laughs> something insane. Nice. Um, and he failed exactly enough damn saves to die. Ugh. And I was like, oh, God, that was, that was <laughs> so close. But it was a lovely game. He was a lovely guy. He, he took the feedback quite well. Um, you know, we talked about... Gene Siller call a lot of things. A lot of things I was saying, which I think is a lot of things that a lot of the comp top level competitive players were saying. Yeah. Um, he didn't seem at all surprised by, and didn't okay. kind of give any pushback on, mm. which to me is very reassuring that maybe they actually have their eye on things correctly yeah. this time. But we'll yeah, see. Yeah. Well, what I would say is, um, you know, it's really good to see, and I think, um, I think it was Coventry where the Games Workshop people first attended the events, uh, or people that are related to the rules development part of the game. I think it's obviously a really positive step towards the game, but. On the off chance, Rich, that you are listening to this podcast, um, you should keep listening. Uh, you know, every couple of weeks that we bring it up, because we do certainly give our honest. Uh, we try to give our honest opinion here, um, despite um, you know being biased towards the armies that we play and whatnot like that. But um, I, I hope you got absolutely destroyed by Desolation Marines and you have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what you deserve. Um, so, game four, day two. <laughs> um, so yeah, like? so I scored. Managed to get another hundred there, and at this point. Uh, yeah, 300. Point, I think Innes had dropped five points. So I was like, got him! We got, no. some, we got some work over Yes, there. we got a um, winner. Innes, of course, being the crazy person he is, is like panicking, like, oh god, am I going to make top cut here after dropping only <laughs> five points? Um, but <laughs> he, was, he ended up being fine. So um, then I played round four against a lovely guy um, named Ben, who was playing guard. Um, and second guard of the game. And what I would say is, we're going to chat about this later, guard was the most representative army uh, with 25 mm -hmm. total uh, competitors playing going into this event. So, go for it, Brian. Yeah, across the whole world, I think they were the most played faction this weekend. Um, so, uh, Ben was kind of newer to guard. He had a very gorgeous army, um, very well painted, um, and uh, but was kind of just getting used to the new kind of kind of guard stuff. But he had a very meta army, I think. He had, mm -hmm. you know, Sentinels, Mortars, the kind of the correct, if I were to say, number of Lehman Russ is kind of that three to four range. Yep. Um, he uh he had a very good list very similar but, to my list i remember looking at this um on the night actually mm. yeah. yeah 
But unfortunately, um, for for Ben, he didn't get the Desolation Marine memo, which meant that he had no Chimeras. Um, <laughs> so, so greedy. <laughs> uh, so he gets turn one, and I was able to leverage one of the best things about Iron Hands, which is we have almost no footprint. Yeah. Um, so I was able to hide my entire army. He got no shots. Um, and then uh, in my first turn, uh, I just picked up from complete safety, picked up the entire Kazarkin squad with Barbakinsky. Oh my Ugh. goodness. So what uh, was, what mission uh, was this? I'm just curious. Uh, this you. was... Um, Number four is Tide of Conviction. Yeah, which is Dawn of War, of course. Uh, yeah. So you actually can't mm-hmm. hide your Kassigans, uh on the back line of the board. Uh, what even? But what I would say is if you start your Kassigans in a Chimera, you can always get them out and then Barbican Key after that. Yeah, that's definitely... Mm-hmm. That's definitely it's very, that's very busted. A lot of, um, this is actually kind of interesting when I was thinking about my deployment for this mission because he had the mortars... Um, and the way that the terrain is to set up for this mission is um, there's these big L's, and for those not familiar with UKTC terrain, there's three, usually three pieces of terrain type. There's a small L that you can kind of stand on. It's not line of sight. It's not obscuring, but it's got no windows. Um, and then there's a medium L mm-hmm. that um, has a, a lip to it, but if you stand on it, there's windows and everybody sees you. So you can't really get cover saves from, from there, but you can be obscured behind it. And then there's this, a large L that has a, a, a big piece, no windows. You can put a lot of stuff on there to get cover. But um, in this mission in particular, the, the his large owl and my large owl are on completely opposite sides of the board. Um, and I know his mortars and his guys are going to going in that big owl because that's the obvious place to put them. Um, but for me to reach him with my guns, um, my 36 inch range guns, I can't put them in my big owl. So it's kind of a risk here where I say, okay, well, am I going to try and stack everything into this little owl that's, that's directly across from his massive um, ruin? Or do I kind of split with the difference and maybe try and block out um, a Kazrakan Alpha Strike on my Desolation Marines in there because he might be able to get an angle and put one squad out of cover, one squad in cover. The risk being that he goes first, uses mortars, and does a bunch of damage, um, which could be quite bad. Um, and that's exactly what happened was I split and he managed to go first, um, but I got lucky on saves. I triggered a, um, a transhuman because uh, he had Finial, which is totally fair as well. Uh, another <laughs> cool rule. Um, so my Fiona Pain Spread did nothing. Um, but uh, managed to lose only only two of the Desolation Marines of that. And then in my strike backs, like I said, picked up the Barbican's Key, picked up a bunch of the mortars. It was, uh, it was uh, I was able to kind of remove their threat and then just just punish them over the course of the game with that unit from then forward. Yeah, and I think Tide of Conviction, a very good map for you, uh, if we were to play. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because absolutely. the staging ruins are very good and the side ruins are very good tide speeders and stuff like that as well to, it's a very good map to screen uh, on for for the barbican key and whatnot so smashed it uh, and 400, 400. 400. <laughs> let's go baby <laughs> um, uh, I will say that, that when you when I play some people and I start to do really well um, I tend to take shock tactics because I want to get hundreds Yeah. Um, and that can be very nerve-wracking um, which is, i think why ennis was so nervous because your opponent has complete control over whether you score that secondary yeah. or not mm-hmm. so they yep. can choose just not to stand on objectives and you won't get that secondary which usually means you win the game because you're not scoring primary as well but in times when you're trying to get 100 points yeah it can be very very nervous and you got to control how quickly you're killing your opponent which admittedly is i guess a good problem to have but uh yeah and i think the whole nervous the whole maxing point thing is up for another discussion as well. I think it's longevity of the game. It'd be nice if we moved on from that. Okay. But uh, going into round five, you rip uh, one of the strongest players of ninth edition. Yes. The uh. Mr. Porter, who I actually said in the team chat, I said I think Mike Porter's got the list to win the tournament because he wasn't playing any Desolation Marines. And I'm a bit um, a meta adjacent. Well, I'm, I'm a bit contrary and I like to vote for someone who's not doing the same thing because I thought going under the desolation would be good but you're at Mike Porter this is a big match what's the mission and kind of what's Mike's list so um, Mike is on as you said Dark Angel Terminators Um, he has 30 Dark Angel Terminators he has um, I think a Talamaster 2 and some and some Lance uh, he's got three land speeders and three units of scouts I think and two, two, two units. storms and two scouts. Yes. Okay, two storms, two scouts, and two units of five infiltrators. So yes. a lot more yep, secondary-orientated right. scoring version of Dark Angels as opposed to the thickness 
data sheet build, I think, was probably fierce. What well, called the other ones, right? He also had the chaplain and Ezekiel. So he was he there for he mortal wounds. Characters. Yeah, he was very well. Yeah, there for the mortal wounds. There for the, the mirror. Of course, having the plus two to charge gives you the seven minute charge from deep strike mm-hmm. as well. When with thirty terminators, you can split them up, get more charges, etc. Right. And Ennis and I, um, when we were looking at the list at the event for kind of the top players, we both agreed that this was a dark angel list we did not want to play against. Yeah. For sure. um, it's the mm-hmm. hardest one for us to kind of kill um, and it's the one where we get the leverage skill in the least amount um, yep. possible just chuck dice at each other and, and eventually one person falls down yeah so I remember you saying uh, in our team chat like well, I'm not really feeling that great about this match um, which I think is you know very fairly said but obviously you take the win kind of wh- how many terminators did you kill in the first turn you got to shoot them <laughs> So, so turn one, you know, Mike shows the table and he's like, you know, look, I'm just, I'm just, and I, I don't think the, for, for, the Mike's credit, I don't think he really enjoyed this list very much. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he hated register, it. He was um, kind of more of a more, I think, much more Mike list than Gene Stiller caught, but then he read the Desolation Marine profile and, and pivoted, <laughs> uh, rightly so. Um, so he kind of showed up to the table and I think he's kind of like, just, he's kind of over it. Um, it's he not a very Mike cut. list. He's like, look, I'm just going to chuck my guys down. I'm going to run at you and we're going to see what happens. Um, and Mike rightly believed that the matchup was quite in his favor um, and that he stat checks me. He wins that. He wins the game. Um, so <laughs> luckily we were playing um, on the uh, the bomb mission, tear down their icons, yep. uh, which is our best mission against Dark Angels. Yep. Um, on any of the corner, other corner missions, I don't actually think that I beat him. Um, but my turn, my turn one, he runs at me. Um, he uses land speeder storm, which up until that point, he didn't realize the scouts could get out of and move. Um, so I thought that during deployment, he's like, wow. Okay. Wow. Oh, the um, more you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just managed to take my opponent stronger before the game started. So I got to remind for not to do that next time. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Brian. Um, but then the, uh, so my, I, I'm able to, after he runs at me a bit, uh, on turn one, I'm able to bring my entire army to bear. Uh, drop pod comes down turn one, everything. And I stay uh, 20.5 inches away, which is 17 inches of their threat range. They respawn a Terminator. Uh, their maximum threat range is 20.5. Lovely. Um, <laughs> and nice. so my plan here is I'm going to pick on one of the squads on the top with my uh, drop pod um, and maybe like one Desolation squad with the direct shots. And then I'm going to just dump everything into a 10-man squad on the far flank. And he's got another squad running towards the center. Um, and I jump up some Vanguard vets to help clean up because I've done this before and been left with a couple Terminators and I know that you don't actually kill them. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So I start shooting. <laughs> and much like Angron, um, the situation, Mike is just popping those fours and I'm like, oh, not like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the first Devastator squad, the first Desolation Marine squad um, activates, does no damage. Then my first Devastator squad oh, no. activates and does no damage. It's not um, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then my three grav squad activated, and he did it did six wounds total, and he just failed every single one of his oh. four ups. Oh, <laughs> so he picked up three tasty. terminators, the multi melta and cherub. I think picked up another two over the course of their shooting as well. So I killed nice. half the squad in that last activation. Uh, so I was like, whew, thank God, that was that was good. Um, and then I brought my entire army to bear on this other ten man squad. Um, killed eight of them and then the vanguard vets with mercy's weakness in combat phase managed to pick up the other two so at the end of turn one nice i'd killed a land speeder storm some scouts 15 terminators and he was not able to hit me at all with his terminators on the crackback and his terminators were just in the middle of the board right so yeah exactly they were gonna get shot another turn completely threat ranged my pod is in a good position um yeah to kind of turn an angle so he can't actually really hide the five man squad now six man um uh, from any of my, my retaliatory shots there. Um, and I think, you know, Mike at this point kind of saw the writing on the wall and actually went ahead and conceded at that point. I don't think he felt much desire to continue playing out with an army he hated yeah. um, in a matchup that had kind of seemed lost at that point. I think um, one thing that I thought about these lists initially, which I believe I was just incorrect on, is that you. I initially thought you should be playing, you know, a group of infiltrators, maybe some tech pieces here and there to play the secondaries rounded off. But what I realized about Dark Angels is that once you kill a couple of the core pieces of the list, its output drops dramatically from ranged. It only has a very limited mm-hmm. amount of ranged output. It only has two cyclones per ten man squad, 
and cyclones are not amazing, especially if they're moving. And then apart from that, you know, it's the Talon Masters, and if they've already used one, you know, if they're buying any lines, you picked it up. Their range output is very, very low. So once you've done that, it's kind of like, well, sure, you can shoot your six cyclone missile launch shots, and then we're on to the charge phase. So, you know, if I'm 17, 12, more than 12 away still, then, you know, I get to shoot my 1,500 points again, mate. Hmm. Uh, Brian, unfortunately, uh, I noticed something on BCP. I don't know if it's an error, but you only got 97 points yeah, in that match. So, whoa. <laughs> I went into this match, whoa. And I'm on 400 points. Uh, Ennis, being the crazy man that he is, because pairings are always hidden at UKTC events, added up everybody else's points that could possibly overcome us. Um, and so I knew that I had like a 10, 13 point advantage here. Yeah. So um, I was thinking about my secondaries and uh, I was actually talking to Manny a bit about it, a bit about the rest of the team. Um, and I kind of came, we came up with the idea of, um, you know, okay, I'm going to do Codex Warfare. I'm going to do Prisoners because um, he's got 30 Terminators from winning the game. I got to kill him. Yep. Um, and then the last mm -hmm. one, which actually was Manny's contribution, was Engage on All Fronts. Um, he suggested that given that it's bombs, um, I want to jump over and leverage that fact as much as possible to kind of equal out the primer I'm going to be missing by staying out of his threat range. Um, and do, while doing that, I'm scoring engage. But as soon as you take engage, nice. unless you're an elf, you are conceding that you're not getting 15. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. and I, but I was okay with that. Like I said, I, I dropped uh, some points, but I, I was, I was a little sad. I wasn't going to get the clean, the clean five. I mean, uh, you know, scoring 97 points against Mike Porter at the end of the day is nothing to uh, be shy about. <laughs> so you took out one of the best players in the world, uh, who has crushed a lot of people, including myself. It was uh, so. it was uh, it was a nice feeling, definitely a nice nice boost. It was unfortunate that the matchup is in almost totally lacking of skill, yeah. um, and just chucking dice at each other. But you know, I would tell people that. Well, yeah, you can take it, man. <laughs> well, done. sometimes. So, uh, off to the top four. You placed first going into the cut, I believe, right? Yes. Yep. First on one hundred and uh, four hundred ninety-seven points. Now, the top four, I think, is probably the most stacked top four we've seen. Uh, interestingly, in this event, none of the good players... Well, I, I don't say it like that. Uh, none of the top, top players seem to have hit each other on rounds one to five, which was quite bizarre. Except for uh, except Brian, for Brian and Mike. Mike. Yeah, that's oh, you, got, okay. you got Alex as well. And you and Alex, that's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of the yeah. marine mirrors, they everyone dodged each other so except for you and Mike. So all four of the lists in the top, eight were, uh, top four were Space Marines, uh, and this top four was stacked. Uh, Manny Chima... Alex Harrison, yourself, Brian, and Ennis Wilson. I think it's fair to say that's probably the most stacked top four we've had to date. I don't think there's been uh, one that can best that. Would you say, Vic? Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. And you know what the interesting thing is? This is all four of them have marine lists, and it's split over three different chapters. Yeah which was really interesting because I think when we were analyzing this first, we just like auto wrote off that Iron Hands was the single best one. The ability to move and shoot without penalty and reroll once to hit and heavy weapons is very yeah. powerful with Iron Hands. Um, but actually, Alex Harrison had the Space Wolves list. Um, and who was the other Dark person? Uh, it, oh, yeah. So there were two Dark, uh, two Iron Hands, which was Innes and Brian. And then there was Dark Angels with Manny and Space Wolves yeah. with Alex. And I, I think... Uh, can I, I'll just take a second just for the listeners just to touch on why I think um, uh, the Desolation Marines are good outside of Iron Hands as well. Um, because I think in Alex Harrison's list in Space Wolves, you wouldn't all automatically think the Desolation Marines would be good. But interestingly, Keen Senses was written so long ago. And Keen Senses is a one CP stratagem for any Space Wolf unit to ignore hit modifiers, wound modifiers, and importantly, ballistic skill modifiers. So these Space Wolf uh, Desolation Marines can actually hit at their completely normal ballistic skill, uh, which is very, very powerful for their indirect the Dark Angel side of things is equally interesting because they get plus one to hit if they remain stationary and stay still. And they have a stratagem, which is two CP to, for a unit to count as remain stationary. So all the way through the game when they're firing their indirect fire, they can get plus one to hit and counteract the, the negative ballistic skill modifier. And then on the turn that they actually come out and move and want to shoot a bit of direct line of sight, they spend two CP and they get plus one to hit. And a direct line of sight means the whole unit's yeah. hitting and on two. in addition to that, you have the freedom of just placing your marines, your desolation marines, touching the outside of the medium ruins, and just accepting you get that one turn to shoot direct and indirect, and then if you die, you know, banner shoot on death, right? So, get a lot of value in Dark Angels. Yeah. Uh, and I think so, yeah. 
good in all of the sub factions. Yeah, King there. Sense is being a good example of where Games Workshop has no obvious um, ability. And ability is the wrong word, but they have. You know, the, obviously they've missed the fact that Space Wolves are a primarily melee based army, but they've introduced a a very potent ranged unit um, across the entire Space Marine line and. Keen Sensors is obviously the best stratagem to use with uh, with these um, units. So you were paired into a Space Wolves player, so Alex Harrison, on this round six. Brian, uh, how did you get on? So uh, this was a really, really interesting matchup, actually, because I think that, and Alex agrees, we were talking about it before, that um, Iron Hands are the one matchup he didn't want to get. It's the Marine matchup that he thinks he loses to. But the Scouring is the best mission, I think, that he could have gotten against us. Um, and the way that the terrain has been has been um, adjusted, um, um, and rightly so, uh, for Zach Spence for these kinds of things means that I can't really get good angles on him unless he's willing to give them to me. Yep, very um, hard to shoot mm-hmm. into your opponent's objectives and deployment zone. Very, very hard on this map. The angles are very close to your opponent's ruins, and there's quite a lot of distance to traverse between your ruins and their ruins for shooting in particular. Um, so... I was trying to think of what secondaries do I take um, into this army. Um, and my concern is, you know, he gives up good prisoner points. Uh, that matches well with Codex Warfare. Um, I could take Shock Tactics while I'm scouring. It's almost definitely going to be able to something I can score. So Shock Tactics definitely happens. Codex Warfare definitely happens. I'll pick up units over the course of the game to probably max that out. Um, the third one was the question mark. If I take prisoners and then I have two kill secondaries, then I am in a situation where if Alex chooses not to play the game, he could beat me on primary um, and just a slight secondary advantage. Um, so the other choice there is I take Oath a Moment, and I just really hope I go second. <laughs> um, so I decided I don't want to give him that ability. I want him to have to come to me and play the game um, so I can play my game into him considering the mission advantage that he has. So I went with Oath and just gave my, my let Jesus take the wheel and uh, <laughs> uh, tried to go second. Uh, Alex took uh, Shock Tactics, Banners, and Codex Warfare. So in his case, he took Banners. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, you know, I got nice and lucky and managed to go second. Alex was very surprised by Oath, I think. Um, and I think rightly so, Alex said it was a big risk. But uh, uh, this game, Alex played really, really cagey. Um, kind of early in the game, he kind of was looking at the board. And I have to say, Alex is one of the best players I've ever played against. He was He's incredibly mm-hmm. good. Very, very um, good. And uh, you know, the way he sees the game was uh, was really, really cool to see. Um, and he kind of realized early in the game, he's like, you know, I don't have to beat you. I just have to beat you by one. Um, so, you know, decisions he's making are trying to get just a slight point of, of advantage here. Like, I will give you a unit on your objective to get shock tactics, but you're only going to get Codex Warfare against me um, and deny a primary here. So I'll go up eight you go up six um and i'll get a two-point advantage there and kind of just increment that over the course of the game so uh unfortunately about halfway th- through my turn two or you know too <laughs> late to have we've already made quite a few decisions we discovered that there was an error with their clock time so we each had about 40 minutes left on the clock to play three three turns um and uh we found out that we lost 14 minutes off each of our clocks it's tough. So yeah. about a half no, hour. Um, half an hour total. Sure to yeah, half hour total off the, off the round. Wow. I'm, not, I'm not sure how that happened, but um, either way, with the situation we're in. So um, what that unfortunately meant is that by the time we got to turn four, we're on very little time left. And so Alex plays his turn. Um, he's got about two and a half minutes left on his clock, and I've got about two and a half on mine. Um, and... Uh, he flies through his turn. In, in my turn three, I had kind of decided I got to go for this. I, I dropped the drop pod in the middle, got an angle, and I killed a lot of stuff. I killed his two Devastator squads. Um, I killed um, uh, all of his Wolfen. I killed I killed almost, and I managed to indirect another Wolf Guard squad. He still had about 30, no, tw- uh, 15, 15, 15. About 15 Assault Marines of various types, because they're all Assault Marines in, in Space Wolves. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he had a... Uh, uh, captain that had fight on death. Not uh, fight on death, sorry, fight last. Um, but Alex then plays his turn four. He jams all of his stuff up towards the middle um, to fight my pod and tag it, you know, rightly so. Um, 
he's going very quick because he has two minutes, you know, so he kind of just puts everyone up, goes like, hey, I killed these Devastators, I'm like, I agree, I take it away, but even despite, you know, kind of shortcutting all that stuff as best we can, um, he's left with seven seconds on his clock. And I'm looking at my mm -hmm. clock, and I'm being in my turn four, and I, I know that if I score out this turn, the um, I'm going to get 69 points, and Alex is going to be on 72. Alex doesn't have... Seven seconds is not enough time for Alex to play the rest of this game. I have a path of victory here where I can uh, I, I can fight him in the middle objective with my 10 Vanguard vets that are in a building, and I've kept for this because I knew this moment was probably going to come. Um, but the fact that he has seven seconds means he can't leverage his fight on, uh, fight last at all um, on, on that captain, which dramatically changes the situation. And um, just a technical point here, you're not allowed to roll dice if you're out of clock, uh, out of time in the clock. So that's what you'd be referring to, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he, so even though he make, could make me, I don't even know if he could make me fight less, but even if yeah. he could, it wouldn't matter because he couldn't roll any attacks into me. Yeah. And that, that dramatically changes kind of the reality of the board. I, I think I can still win even if we had time, but it was not deterministic at all. Um, and so I'm kind of mm -hmm. looking at this and I decided, you know, it's not fair for me to exploit this. I don't think um, we've had a really great game up to this point. Really interesting, really well, um, well kind of discussed and communicated and it's been it's, it was a pleasure to play against, and I was like, I don't really want to win um, mm -hmm. a round by by death clocking somebody like this. So I, I ended up agreeing to end the turn, end the game on turn four there to keep it even, um, and uh, that that gave Alex the win though by three points. Yeah. Yeah, and that's your prerogative, man, there, because, I mean, it would be a different story if you had a lot of time left on your clock and your opponent hasn't. They've had a considerably more time to think about their turns. But when you've only got, like, the dying embers of your clock left on both sides and the path to victory involves, you know, the, the obvious path to victory involves you taking advantage of them being clocked out, the lines start to get a little bit blurred on ethics um, for yeah. that one. So, you know, pro props to you for your decision there. And, you know, if people decide to go the opposite way with that particular decision, that that's their choice as well. The, I'll play the devil's uh, advocate. Personally, I wouldn't do this, but go I think there's a devil's, a devil's advocate that says whether you have four minutes or 40 minutes remaining on your clock is irrespective because time is time. Um, and I think that would be the chess oriented way of looking at it as well. But obviously we don't play chess and our game is much more social and dynamic than mm -hmm. that as well. What I would say is that Vic and I have been um, more than generous in praising the UKTC circuit for how great it is. And it is the best Weimar circuit in the, in the world. But it's unacceptable that games are starting 30 minutes late and it's not up to the mm -hmm. players to be on time to start the round. Not at all. Because the way that these cuts work, guys, is you play your round five, which is game two of day two. Then the award ceremony happens and you have to move your army and set up your army while the award ceremony is going on, etc., etc. Now, it is on. it should be on no onus player's onus to make sure that you're understanding when the round is starting on a, in a completely different cut-to-top four uh, tournament, etc., etc., the judges should be there saying the round needs to start now. You need to start um, playing, etc., etc. No matter how stressful that is for the players, it needs to be extremely clear when the round starts mm -hmm. and when the time starts. Because I had the exact same thing with Manny Chima when I played at Southampton. Yep, I had it against Manny as well. And in the we played on a well. two and a half hour clock. And just for the, mm -hmm. just for the, for the people that perhaps are maybe an aspiring competitive player, it is ex and and. Maybe this is a hot take, but it is extremely difficult to play a flawless game of 40k in three hours. Extremely difficult. And we All right, guys, we're back. Sorry, had a bit of a technical difficulty there. Uh, I've kind of done my rant. Um, but uh, <laughs> let's just hope it cut in all right. But uh, Brian, kind of, what are your thoughts, uh, kind of, on that? If you uh, if you wanted to remark on it, I mean, it's it's definitely frustrating. Um, Alex and I started our game um, during the award ceremony. When we started the clock, we each had an hour and twenty eight minutes on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there was a miscommunication, if the rounds and the elimination rounds were shorter, um, but the fact that we had gotten so far into our game without the clocks being confirmed um, was really upsetting. And I think was a big part of why I chose to not play the game out um, for a turn five, because it's it was unfair that we each lost 14 minutes. I mean, if Alex had those 14 minutes, Money. he plays that last turn or um, probably differently, certainly a lot more carefully. Um, 
and uh sorry my cat's in the back <laughs> uh, um, uh and so like that's where it really became unfair while if he had, had clocked actually a zero from the full hour and a half game that we were promised um that is much more on him right mm -hmm. um and he probably plays those first turns faster if we have 15 minutes less on our clocks yep uh, i know i certainly would so um <laughs> it was definitely upsetting um also um we had been told by one of the, by the judge that we had 14 minutes less on our clock and then when we were entering the turn four territory he told us that we had to stop at the 60 minute mark um at when he told us that i looked him in the face and i said we're not doing it <laughs> um but it's just like twice was a bit much once was was crazy but yeah so it's definitely very very upsetting especially considering how interesting and i think um well we were both mm. playing that game i was very happy with how i played it you know i asked him afterwards and he had he had one or two suggestions but no obvious mistakes and i don't have any for him either you know it was it was a great game um that i really wish could have been seen to its conclusion it's a shame that something like that just spoils it doesn't it you know mm. both players are hard working too um you know it's not easy to play a big tournament like this and play high high level games like that so when it kind of gets snatched from uh, from the jaws of victory it's uh tough isn't it and i just do want to point something out i know that you chose to end the game on turn four but you were also not allowed to talk the game out is that correct is yeah that's style? that's that's an important detail as well so so alex and i at some point you know we we're running really long clock and we kind of both were like hey let's see if we can talk this out and figure out how um the game is going to end because you know we're both yeah good players we can probably agree on on damage outputs here and get an idea of how of what happens um and we were expressly told that we are not allowed to do that. Yeah. Which is fair, but then it's even more important mm. that the clocks are accurate. Yeah. And what I would say, on, and I really want to say something on this, uh, I think for the health of the community, talking it out and where, where it is appropriate is a very useful tool for both players to come to a more positive conclusion about a game. What I really dislike, I really dislike, is when rules are not enforced uh, to the T or they're not, or they're enforced um in a cherry picking way so it's you know look if you listen to the podcast you go to tournaments talking about it's a very common thing about warhammer it's a it's a it's an abstractualization of the rules that allows you to um come to a conclusion about something and facilitates players to play the game to a certain extent right um what i don't like is when someone says actually in this case you're not allowed to talk it out because it's one thing for something to be commonplace but then to be suddenly told no you're not allowed to do this just completely invalidates having the rule in the first place if it's applied situationally i would rather we have absolutely zero talking it out or actually okay you know it's a finals there's like 10 people in the room you know we've all three of us have been there you know it's like come on man like <laughs> we're all here to have fun right like, oh. and i'm sure there's a good reason why he has that rule but it is odd that that rule exists yeah during the knockout stage when the points are at their least relevance <laughs> right so like, it's just a matter of who's first past the post right so yep. so so it, that's when you feel like if anything the talking out should be the most okay yeah because there's no advantage you gain by getting points that you might otherwise have, have somebody might have questioned you on your ability to get which is an important distinction by the way to make you know there's there's talking out then they're just giving you and your opponents points that you correct could not or did yep. not earn definitely um, it's a delicate balance to play but i think you just you take it a turn at a time you agree with your opponent and you be reasonable check yourself when you're doing that too don't just get the points because they're on offer um but really be realistic with yourself you know i mean that's why i only got the only got the 97 against Mike is, <laughs> is we were like you know hey I can't get all these engage points like I'm only getting a two here and a two here yeah. um, and a two here I'm not getting the the full threes on this and yeah. um, I think that's important yeah and yeah it's just a shame because I know that um, in situations like that where both players could easily facilitate something you know let's say you know hypothetical you know you table your opponent's army but it's turn three and you're not allowed to talk it up it's like well I don't even have to talk it out I just stand here and do nothing and I win um so yeah it's a bit of a shame to see something like that crop up in what was probably the densest top four to ever happen um so but you know props to you brian for handling yourself in a situation like that i know it's not easy and something i've struggled with having um dealt with similar situations um in the past but you sound like you handle it better than, <laughs> better than I. Have. and you smashed it brian really really in this particular tournament to come fourth is absolutely incredible because it was an it was a real shock tank uh, and you were consistent and great. And even your loss was a very narrow loss that you could have won. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I will say that, you know, kind of my decision from a sportsmanship side was driven largely, um, 
you know, by by both my WTC experiences, which is a wonderful tournament mm-hmm. for those interested, check it out. Mm-hmm. But also by by you guys, by Ignite, um, and kind of our, our ethos that we've we've discussed in depth <laughs> about what we want from players um, and what we expect as from each other as players, um, and kind of as a phrase that is you know I'm sure people are tired of hearing, but playing the game in the right way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Should we get on to something more positive or negative? Yeah. I wanted to have a chat about the meta. Okay. Um, because I think there were some really interesting things happened uh, happened this weekend. We had a Depticon one by Nassim Fushane, mm-hmm. which uh, I... The terrain format is, for lack of better words, a joke, I think. Um, <laughs> this is the ideal tournament for, for <laughs> Nassim to win, because he wins a super major, but it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, look, look and, well, yeah, look, I don't, no, Nassim will listen to this, and I don't want to take anything away from his accomplishment. Um, I, no, I genuinely mean that, but yeah, um, w- where this comes into the meta discussion is that Guard did win Adepticon, and Votan was second, and the other armies in Adepticon finals were a mixture of Guard and Tau. Uh, okay, none of those three armies were present in, on the UKTC uh, terrain format, which is, by all opinions, I think pretty balanced at this point. Uh, there are some missions which are a lot more combat orientated. Some missions were a bit more shooting orientated, which is a really healthy mix to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that just goes to show how fast and competitive the meta is here in the UK. Because one thing where I wanted to segue this was actually the state of guard right now. Um, if you look at Southampton versus uh, this tournament, it is basically night and day from the introduction of one unit. Uh, and that would obviously be the Desolation Marines. And uh, there was a little bit of a Discord discussion where someone said, oh, there were six undefeated guard players going into round four. And I said, I bet you $5. And actually, I said this in the same, and someone else. I said, I bet you both $5. There'll be no undefeated guard make the top, make 5-0. and And they're like, no, no, just by the sheer numbers, they'll be fine. And I looked at the pairings, and I was like, I think they'll all lose this round. And all six guard players lost that round. Yep. Uh, which, so it has the highest player representation, but none of them were in a win- tournament winning position and going into the fifth round, which I think really says something about kind of the army, its complexity, but also the new developments in the meta um, and how that kind of really has hit the army super hard. So I thought that was just an interesting statistic, you know, zero guard in the tournament winning position after round four, but having the highest faction um, representation going into the tournament. And, you know, you could argue the strongest army in the game going into the tournament, right? Well, it helped that uh, the two best guard players in the UK were not there. One was in <laughs> Chicago, and, and <laughs> you were home. Yeah. Um, so that definitely, um, definitely, I think, affected things. But I do think it was mainly Desolation Marines yeah. and the fact that the meta wasn't ready for them. So I'm very keen to see how um, guard adapt. The obvious answer is more transports, but the question is, is that enough? Um, I mean, the Kazakhans coming out of a transport are much weaker than Kazakhans starting on the mm-hmm. board because they don't get the command phase buffs. Yeah, I so, don't. Uh, I don't think they're playable curious. anymore. I'm, I'm not going to be playing them. Uh, I don't think that they. Uh, I think they just the, the payoff for playing them into Desolation Marines is just it's just not there, right? Who Kazakhans? No, the guard in general. <gasps> I just think the um, the payoff Dang. there is not there. Um, Come on, mate. If, to work, if to I'm work doing so this hard. with elves, you've got to do this with God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to climb, take a hard pass. I'm climbing it. this hill on my own. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it could be okay. I mean, we have to see what the balance update brings. Yeah, um, correct. There's a lot of ways that they can where they can really nip a lot of this in the bud without even directly nerfing mm-hmm. Desolation Marines just by solving problems with Marines that are overpowered right now um, in general. So it's really a question of how they choose to approach it. Are they seeing the game frankly correctly or are they misunderstanding the fundamental issues that are going on right now yeah that's a really salient point there because uh it's very unlikely desolation marines get touched directly either their data sheet or their points cost but if other aspects of the army gets touched either their special rules like dev doctrine being going back to how it was just for one turn uh or just the points changes on some of the war gear for the terminators and things the whole list design changes around that or the output changes with changes to dev doctrine so very interesting to see Mm, really good nice uh so in terms of the other top meta i guess you know if you were to look at the meta would you look at towards adepticon or would you look towards uktc i think you take KTC is definitely going to be a better representation of where the meta is at uh, at the moment. And I think we've accelerated to a, a very developed part of the meta, despite it being only one tournament, uh, uh, because I don't think the lists are going to gravitate too much 
there may be some meta within a meta um, of people's lists, but uh, I think some of these lists look pretty well rounded. I don't know if mm-hmm. many people would be changing their lists very much uh, going into their tournament unless they were metering for maybe a sub meta uh, or something like that, right? I think all we're going to see is is the different Space Marine factions, all things remaining the same, different Space Marine factions kind of even out towards the correct version of the Desolation Marine list for them, mm-hmm. um, which just makes them more powerful. Um, but um, I don't know. We'll see. I'm <laughs> nervous about it because cause this is the rest of ninth edition, right? This upcoming balanced data slate. So yeah. Um, the thing I would say is that I think this balanced data slate is going to come very soon. Like based on last year, it was released the week after Adapticon. And if it is released in this coming week when this episode is released, then there's a good chance that events later in the month, particularly in the UK, all the events are later this month, uh, later in April, uh, will use the balanced data slate. So that could completely change the, the meta. So hopefully we get a correction enough that it's not just variations of Marines with desolation marines in all of the top results okay here's a question mm-hmm. one change in the balance data slate that does not nerf your army you cannot pick something related to your army what would it be Vic? uh just a dev doctrine one turn tactical doctrine turn two turn three or switch to assault doctrine on turn three just like how it was before that change alone is all i need in my life okay. so brian you can't pick space marines but what would it be what would the one change be <laughs> Um, how about how about strictly dark angels, baby transhuman on all the terminators? Wow. Okay. I Brutal. thought you were gonna mention. I thought you were gonna say Cassian for sure. But uh, no, no, Cassian are dead. That's the past, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bloody hell. Um, I will, I will cheat and say Cassian need to get uh, nerfed. Either that or the Finial needs to get nerfed. You both um, cheated there. Just, just as a point. <laughs> codex. Okay. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, you know, that's. I mean, I think that's a little bit. It's a little bit too strong, isn't it? Really. I think. I think that it's. Uh, it's the real problem uh, with the uh, with the meta right now is that hive guard are too strong. <laughs> I need another nerf. Yeah. Yeah. Nerf them. Yes. yeah. I think zone throats go up a little bit too because they're really good against um dark needles terminus. It is rather interesting, right? Because if, if tyrannids hadn't been put under the ground, um, they would be very powerful into this dark angels list. Yeah, they would be. Those warriors would be going straight in there. Mortal wounds would be going straight in. Yeah, high mortal wound output has fallen off the cliff a little bit in this meta, and that's a very direct counter for some of these lists, including Dark Angels. Um, but, you, you know, let's see what innovation comes out of this, because there is room for innovation once you see, once you know what the, the top of the meta is going to be, there's room for innovation, innovation to counter the top of the meta, and I think there definitely is room with this Desolation Marine unit. Yeah. There we go. There's room, there's hope. There's a bright and bold future beyond the wastelands of desolation that we are currently in. <laughs> uh, that rounds off uh, a nice lengthy episode. We've been uh, we've just been chopping the cheese, chewing the fat, and we've had Brian Saipere, our new teammate for Team Ignite, crushing it, uh, going uh, fourth place. Vic, I think you also got sixth, right? Sixth going place, 5-0. Nice. 5 and 0. Uh, Really nice. We've got the London Open uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And then we've got the GW tournament as well. So I think what we'll probably do is maybe get an episode out if the balanced data slate change comes in. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can bring Brian back to uh, talk about it from a marine perspective. And uh, with that, I'd like really like to thank Brian for coming on the episode. Uh, he's such a lovely guy, and uh, he's a really stand-up player, as I hope kind of came through, obviously, there as well. And he's uh, technically very brilliant at the game as well. So oh, I appreciate that, man. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's uh, incredibly handsome as well. Um, so yeah, that, that is fact. <laughs> and we fun actually, fact, um... actually, wait, fun mm. fact about Brian in Vegas. Here's a funny story. <laughs> if you got this <laughs> far into this. the episode, you got this far into the episode, you're still listening. We're out, we're out of Vegas. We go gambling. Brian's like, look, let's start the night off with a bang. <laughs> we're on to roulette. Brian's <laughs> like, I got seven hundred dollars here. I'm gonna smash it all on red. And I'm like, no way, Brian. There's no way because if you lose it, then we're like out. We're gonna have a terrible night. I'm like, he's like, okay, I'll put five hundred. The mad lad, five hundred on red, doubles up, and then we're off for the next like four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. They wouldn't let me double up again. That's the only reason why I wasn't yes. higher. And I actually kept that five hundred dollar chip in my back pocket because <laughs> I wouldn't let Brian use it. put it in his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great night. There we go, guys. That's the Fireside signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed episode 18. We'll be back and uh, quickly approaching the episode 20 mark. So there you go. Have a good one. Cheers, guys. See you next time. See you later.
Thank you for listening to the 40k Fireside Podcast. Vic and I hope you've enjoyed listening and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you can provide after the show.